think I'm green. Okay. Huh. <laughs> get started here. Um, if you would stand with me as we read our call to worship. Each week we do this to focus our hearts and quiet our minds to really receive the word of God. This morning our call to worship comes from Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord God, our maker. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you this morning expectant, expectant for your goodness, uh, your forgiveness, and your resurrection on the cross, Lord. Thank you for paving the way um, that we might come before our God with freedom. Father, we worship you this morning for your kindness and your goodness, Lord. Just so, so thankful um, to enter this fall season in this Abound series. Um, we praise you in Jesus' name. Let us go to the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit, as we sing.
So often, when I, when I look at myself, I find that I, I'm not putting my, all of my faith, all of my hope in the Lord. And I don't know if you feel that too, but in our pride, we in our fallen state tend to try to take care of ourselves. We try to carry our own weight. Sometimes it's out of a twisted motivation to impress God, to show him how much we've grown. Sometimes it's out of a prideful neglect. I don't need him. I can do this myself. But in all of it, we forget the goodness that is Christ on the cross. We forget what he's done for us, that he came to earth, took on human form, suffered, and died for us so that we can be washed clean. He's present in heaven, begging us to begging us to give it all to him, to let go of these burdens that we carry. So with that in mind, we, we pray this prayer of confession together, remembering where we've fallen short and remembering his goodness. Let's pray this together. Jesus, you are the light of the world. You came to serve and to save. Your ways are humble and gentle, yet we are stubborn people who cling to darkness. Our ways are often arrogant and harsh. We fail to love you like you have loved us. We confess our lack of trust in you and return again now to your kindness. We return to the forgiveness you offer us through your sacrifice. Help us, Holy Spirit, to receive your committed love for us, that we may be filled with joy and empowered to love our neighbors in humility and kindness. Amen. Through his death and then into his resurrection, Christ also gave us, gave us new life. We're washed clean, and so we have this prayer of assurance. Let's pray. He says, do not lose hope. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. With his blood, he has purchased people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. He has made them to be a kingdom and, and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. This is who we are. We're remade through Christ. Let's continue to sing.
strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. This is the word of the Lord. Hey, I'm married a boy. And I'm Jason the boy, and we have been at Vintage for about 14 years now. Yeah, um, sorry, we've been having like technical difficulties with that all morning. We were kind of hoping it would go through, but just so you know, if you go to the uh, Vintage Durham Facebook page, you'll be able to see the Du Bois story and hear more about, learn more about Abound. For those of you uh, who are new, uh, welcome. We're so glad you're here, uh, worshiping the Lord with us together. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm a pastor here at Vintage Church Durham. Vintage Church Durham is a part of a larger church, Vintage Church. It's one church in four Context for congregations, uh, soon to be a fifth one in Chapel Hill. We're really excited about that in 2022 with Pastor Brian Pell. Uh, it's just a very exciting time for us as a church as we look to the next year, the next 10 years, the next 20 years, and we consider uh, what this could be for our church and what we could be uh, in terms of a gospel presence and a gospel witness uh, doing uh, the work of, of uh, proclaiming the goodness and the year of the Lord's favor as it was, were and, and doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly in our community. And over the next 20 years, we want to see a lot of those things happen. And so, as you know, we've been walking through Abound and Nehemiah and, and just this just sort of culminating in who it is we're going to be, how it is we're going to get there, and, and, and what it is to explore how God might use not just us as a church, right, organizationally, but also you and I as the church together. Uh, one of the ways that we're going to celebrate what God has done and look forward to what God is doing is uh, at, at our, it's called the Advance Commitment Night. It's this Tuesday. Uh, if you haven't signed up and, and you're wanting to come, please go ahead and sign up. You can go to Vintage. Uh, nc.com backslash abound and you'll see sign up for that I'd really love to encourage you to come it's going to be a time of celebration even if you're like I'm I don't know what I'm I, I don't know I just want to see what this is about uh, I would encourage you to come we're one 
church family. And, and I can honestly say, as a church family, we have benefited so much. And when I say as a church family, I mean as Vintage Church Durham, we have benefited so much from being a part of the, the greater Vintage Church family uh, in terms of our own sustainability and the work that we're doing. Um, it's good. This, 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 uh, this model, uh, and I can say this as somebody who's planted a church sort of parachute model versus being a part of a, a, a church plant that is connected to, to like a, a family of churches, this model is, is really beneficial. And so we can be there on Tuesday uh, to, to celebrate what God is doing. And so I, again, it's, it starts at seven o'clock. Childcare is provided. Um, and we'd love to see you. It's at Union Station in Raleigh. And I know it's, I know it's a hike. Um, but it's one that I'm excited to make. And so I, I'd love to see as many of our Durham people out there to rep, you know, um, do we say the D? I'm not, like, I'm new to Durham. Do we call it the, to rep the D? Can I say that? And you guys just uh, uh, understand what I mean, right? And if you're, like, from Durham, be like, nobody calls it the D. I know, I'm not from Durham. I just got here, guys, but I want to be, like, I want to get to the point where I can say I'm from Durham, right? You know what I'm saying? So um, come, come to that. Also, if you're new... Uh, we want to get to know you a little bit better. And so if you, in front of you, there's a connect card. And you can fill that out. And we'll get your information. And either Phil, who's not here today, or myself, will get up with you. We'd love to get coffee, lunch, just get to know you a little bit better. You get to know us a little bit better. Uh, we're in Nehemiah chapter 4. And before we dive into that, before we chop up this text, let's go ahead and go to the Lord together. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for your love. We're so grateful for your kindness. We're so grateful for your word. And as we come to it this morning, pray that you would give us hope, that you give us peace, faith, joy, but above all, love. May we be filled with love for you, for your people, for the work that you're doing in your creation. In Jesus' name, amen. Just as a brief recap in Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah was a cupbearer of the king Artaxerxes, right? And so Nehemiah is a, 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 a national, he's, he's an ethnic Jew who is born in captivity. Uh, and as he learns about the state of Jerusalem, the city where his fathers are from, the cities where his fathers were taken, from, where, from which his fathers were taken. He learns about the state of it, and his heart is stirred. The wall is destroyed. The gate is broken. The people and the city lie in ruins. And his heart is broken with compassion. He sees the brokenness, the injustice. He sees the spiritual decay. He sees the existential crisis. He sees uh, the, the physical reality of, of his people, and his heart is stirred to action to move. And so he goes and he prays to the Lord and he asks the Lord to give him wisdom and strength to provide for the work that he is about to engage in. And he goes to the king for whom he is cupbearer. And he tells, and the king sees his sorrow. The king sees the brokenness of Nehemiah, asks him what's wrong and what he needs. And Nehemiah is, has assessed the situation and he knows what he needs. And he asks boldly, may I go? Send me to Jerusalem to repair the wall. And on top of that, send me with, with uh, lumber, with, with laborers in order to rebuild the wall. And so he goes. And, and last week we talked about how when he got there, he left the group that he was with. And he himself actually uh, went from hearing about and having sort of this intellectual assent to the problem to actually walking amongst and seeing and experiencing the brokenness, the rubble, the wall, the ruin. And as he does, his heart breaks even further. And now what's happened is he has gone to the people and he said, it's time to get to work. And the people have taken, they've leveraged what they have, their time, they've leveraged their families. If they had servants, they've leveraged their servants. If they had any sort of resources, they leveraged it for the sake of the wall of rebuilding and restoring the city. And we've said that Nehemiah is a glimpse into what God is doing. 
the redemptive historical work of God, the redeeming uh, uh, movement of the Lord. And it's, it's a glimpse into the work that God invites us into through his son Jesus. That we look at the world around us and we see brokenness. We see injustice. We see indifference. We see spiritual apathy and death. And our hearts, like the heart of God, and like the heart of Nehemiah, are to be stirred for that. If you look at brokenness, and your heart is unmoved, then the real concern, the real prayer, is if your heart is of stone or of flesh. Right? If you can look at the the plight and the suffering of people, and be unstirred to action. Even prayer and just movement to speak, to act, to live, to do. Then there is a greater prayer that I have for you and that you ought to have for yourself. And that is, Lord, would you take this heart of stone and soften it and make it a heart of flesh so that I might love like you love. And too often, the way that our lives and the way that our society is structured, we either are distracted, hyper-entertained, so our eyes are always called to look away, or we find ways to profit off of it, right? Whether that be uh, profiting through just as, as an example, like profiting through an, a prison industrial complex where, where people make money. People make money off of this. Or profiting through performative justice and wokeness, where companies make money by looking like they care, by projecting care. Right, And that, that's in this broad sense, but we do it in our own ways too. So we either ignore or we profit, but do we love? And the call of Scripture is the call to love. And Nehemiah sees and hears and feels and, and walks into and enters into and is stirred by love. Love for God, love for his people, love for the broken. And he acts. And the people act with him. And here's the thing. Like, I remember, um, and some of you are are closer to being out of college than me. And some of you have been out of college for a longer time. You know, and and if you haven't gone to college, also, same thing. Like, that youthful childhood, that youthful uh, exuberance that is just so idealistic. And so, like, I remember getting out of college, even out of seminary, and just knowing These things are what's wrong, and these things are how you fix it. And look, they were just lazy. They didn't care, but I care, and we care, and we're going to fix it. And then you run out. And man, just the, the, the disdain for people who aren't doing what you know will fix it, and just the certainty that what you're doing will fix it, and then remembering that first time, like, this is... This is when you become an adult. Uh, Like, where does this go? This is where you become an adult. The first time that life kicks you in the teeth so hard that you're not sure if your ideology actually works. The first time you have to question whether or not you even, like, like, is this all just for nothing? Right, like there are other markers, and I, you know, but like is, if you've been there, you've been there. When you know, you know, right? And it happens again and again. We have these ideals. We have this goal. We have this vision. We're walking towards it, and then we meet like severe, serious challenges, Right? And this is what happens to the people of God at the wall in chapter 4. They begin, and they're meeting challenges. We we read verses 10 through 14, but we're really looking at the whole chapter. And it says, when Sambalet heard, and we've we've heard about him last week. Sambalet is opposed to this mission to rebuild the wall and to restore the people of God who are in captivity. 
right? He, he's, he's in power. He knows it will undermine his power, and he does not want any part of it. He wants it to stop. And here he comes hearing that they're building the wall, and he's angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered the Jews, and he said in the presence of his brothers and the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heap and rubbish and the burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him. And he said, yes, what are they building? If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone walls. Immediately. What we've seen from the beginning of Nehemiah and what we continue to see is that there are going to come challenges to the restorative work that God has called his people to. And we're going to look at a few of those challenges today in chapter 4. The first challenge that we're seeing is just opposition from outside. Outside opposition to the work of the Lord, to the work of God's people. Here it takes the form of Sanballat and and, uh, Tobiah and and the the Ammonites and and these folks who are provoked to anger and it says even later that they plot to kill them. They'll know what's happening. They'll they won't know until we are upon them and they are killed. They are plotting to stop the work of God's people. Now, like now might be a good time to like turn it to us, but I actually don't want to do that. For a second, I want to to just be careful and to to let you know that this is a story about what God has done in God's people in the past. And sometimes the Bible, you may have heard me say this before, and I'll say it again, I promise. Sometimes the Bible is prescriptive. It tells you what to do. It's giving you sort of commands, and it's giving you this way of living and this way of walking and working. And sometimes the Bible is descriptive. It's simply telling you what happened. And, and the goal of descriptive texts like this one ultimately is to look at the goodness of the Lord and to be pointed to his work and to see his goodness, right? And so we can see this and we can say, well, we've got to be like these people and we are like these people. And here's the thing, um, just a little like sort of his sociological, historical, theological context for us where we are now, right? Um, the United States of America is, is among, if not the first country that was founded by Protestants. And it was founded in combat. And Protestants, if you hear it in the name, Right? What's central to Protestantism? Protest. Right? Combat. And so when you put these two things together, here's what we find as American Christians often, is that we, we almost have this need to be in combat with somebody else, to feel a, like opposition. And sometimes the opposition is there, and sometimes it's just not. And what I don't want us to imagine is that any time we go and we do work of justice, mercy, and humility before God, that anything that we see that's not us is against us. But sometimes it is. And sometimes there's opposition. And this is what the people of God here experience. They experience a people who want them to fail, who want them to be lower than, who want their plans thwarted. And even at a very real sense, we can say that though it's, it's Tobiah who's named and though it's Sambalat who's named, ultimately these, as, as, as Paul tells us, our battles not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and forces of darkness. What's happening here is God's redemptive work is happening and the forces that would oppose the enemy, the deceiver, right, that would oppose the redemptive work of God shows up. Whenever redemption is happening, forces that oppose redemption show up in order to offset it, in order to confound and confuse, which is what they say. We have to be aware of that. 
We believe that God has called us to this place in this time so that we might be agents of reconciliation, of restoration, so that the love of God might abound, so that the justice of God might abound. And if we are really living into and leaning into that, we can expect opposition from the enemy. Again, I'm not speaking in terms of flesh and blood, but in terms of spirit. The enemy opposes the redemptive work of God and God's people. But that's not the only challenge they face. We then come to verse 10, which we just heard. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And in this, we actually see three different challenges to the mission. Number one, the fact is we are finite. We are small and with limited strength. We build our lives so that we're central in it. And from our perspective, we, we feel that way. But I want you for a second to just think of the story of the universe. Or even to just think of the universe itself. You are remarkably small. I am remarkably small. We build and we build and we work and we work. And all it takes is a flood, a hurricane, a fire, the sands of time to take even our greatest achievements and turn them to dust. From dust we came and to dust we return. You are not enough. On your own. In your strength, we are finite. And so often, we live our lives, not even just just in like doing redemptive work, not even just in pursuing mercy, justice, grace, the gospel, right, reconciliation, not even in those things. Like I'm talking just our day-to-day life. We live it as though we just can keep going. Right? We're the the Energizer Bunny. Some of you are way too young for that. Thank you to the the grays with me, like my fellow gray folks who are like, I know what you're talking about. So, (sighs) Energizer's a battery. You guys know that. Once upon a time, there was a TV commercial set. (laughs) And, and, and the theme was that there was the bunny and there was a battery in its back and, and the bunny just kept hitting the drum and going and going and going and that was the whole thing. It's like other batteries, the bunny would be just keeled over. Energi- all right, so we're all caught up now. We're up to speed. Great. <clears throat> so TV, like it didn't used to just be streaming where you could skip the commercial. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. Um, and so the Energizer bunny, right, and we think like we can just keep going and going and going. In fact, we've made it a virtue to keep going and going and going. We've created it. We've made this world where, like, the best thing you can feel to say to somebody when they ask how you are is, oh, man, I'm just so busy, right? We've made busyness a virtue because it makes it seem like we're achieving and we're producing. And if busyness and production are virtues, then rest is a vice. The problem is God created us to rest. And God created rest for us. And time and time again, the call of God's people is to rest in him. Why? Because rest reminds us that we can't keep going and going and going. We are utterly dependent. And rest restores us because we can't keep going and going. We're utterly dependent. And so here they come, and they say, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. Their own weakness, their own humanity, which is a good thing, is a challenge to the work. The strength 
of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble by ourselves. We will not be able to rebuild the wall. So the first, like, we see the opposition from outside. Then we see the weakness that we are, like the, the lack of strength, the exhaustion, the, ti- the, the way we get tired of doing the work and by doing the work, we become tired. But then also we see that they're alone in this. There aren't enough people, even people for whom this matters, who are doing the work. They said, we're tired of doing this alone. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. There's so much work to be done. And we need other people. Let me bring it in here. There's so much work to be done, and we need each other. Right? So often the way that we think about and the way that we practice life as a church, so much gets done by invisible actors that we forget that it's us. It is us who are the church and it's us who accomplish the mission of the church together empowered by God. And therefore you forget that you are needed. We need you. We need you. We need you to bear one another's burdens. We need you to love and pray for one another. We need you to be a community together. We need you to to do the work together. We need you. In some ways, that's what we're doing over the course of this series is we're inviting you to, to assess and to consider and to engage with the work of the ministry, with the work of justice and reconciliation, with the work of gospel proclamation, out of who you are, right? And also out of rest. That's why I started with rest before coming to this. Because the fact is, we don't want laborers, we want worshipers. And when you worship and you work out of worship, that's different than when you labor out of guilt and obligation. So rest in Jesus and see what Jesus calls you to. And then whatever Jesus calls you to, do it. Do it. There's too much. There are too few laborers, too few workers. Too few people doing it, and they will not be able to do it by themselves. But tucked in the middle of there is why. It says, there is too much rubble. The fact is, the scope of the work is too much. And this is one of the ways that it really hits you, right? The longer you go, the further you go, right? When you begin to see isolated incidents as not isolated incidents, but sort of this whole thing that we see, this whole scope of the brokenness in the whole world. And you begin to say, where am I going to jump in? What do I do? It's easy to become like a kid whose room is way too messy. It's gotten so messy that when they look at it, they can't even know where to begin. Right? Like, do you, if you have kids, you've seen that. If you remember, like, being, you might remember that. You just look at the room, and it's like, there's no one thing I can do. And you look at it, and you're like, I can't play outside or be on screens until this room is clean, and I see at least, at least, just, just bare minimum conservative estimate, a thousand years of work in here. You get so overwhelmed that you get paralyzed. You become paralyzed. And this happens with us. Where to start the work of justice? Jobs? Hunger? Right? Uh, racism? Misogyny? Where do we start? Greed? Let's go on and on. The unborn, where do, where do we start? It's too much. And then when you start on one thing, you get everybody yelling at you that you're not doing their thing. It's too much. Here's a secret. It's too much. 
You're not wrong. You're not wrong. It's too much. Too much on your own. For certain. And yet, and yet, God has called us into the too much. Not as people who say it's too much and who sit back, but who say it's too much for me. It's too much for me. And here's the fact. It's that it's not too much for the Lord. Right, so the people of God here in Nehemiah, they see this. They, they face the opposition from outside. They face sort of the apathy or the, 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 the being alone in the work from inside. They face their own weakness because it is all too much. And so what do they do? They keep working. They invite more people of their people in. It says they have to arm themselves against the outside opposition. They're ready. Like, <laughs> I love this. In one hand, they're, they're, they're like, they're putting the, the mortar on the walls for the, you know, and on the other hand, they have a sword in case somebody comes, right? Parry, parry, thrust, right? Like, and this is how they're doing it, right? Like, it's, it's wax on, wax off while, while Johnny is coming and kicking you. Like, it is insane. That's how they do it. We're going we're gonna to destroy our enemies, and we're going to build the wall, and so we're going to make people come with their servants to come build the wall. We're going to do it one piece at a time. And that's what they do. And here's the thing. It's that we don't live on that side of the cross. We live on this side. We live on this side of the work of Jesus because the, the opposition and the challenges that Nehemiah and his people face are just a microcosm of the opposition that, that the redemptive work of God faces day in and day out since the fall and even before. God sees this opposition. He sees our weakness. He sees how few laborers there are. And what does he do? He enters into the story. He enters into history. He enters in and he himself comes in the form of Jesus. And what does Jesus do with the opposition? He loves his enemies to the point of death. Jesus confounds death not by killing his enemies but by being subject to death. And in the death of Christ we see the death of death. That opposition is thwarted in the most ironic and in the most gracious of ways. Jesus says, you want to kill me, kill me. And he's raised again. Jesus sees the scope and the weakness of his people. When he sees the weakness of his people, what does he say to them? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and my burden, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me and find rest for your souls. The invitation of Jesus in the midst of our weakness is not to do more. Work harder and eventually you'll earn my love. Work harder and eventually you'll, right? Like there does come a point where Paul is going to say that, that like an athlete training for a marathon, we beat our bodies and we, we wear ourselves down and we train and we do the work so that we might, uh, we might receive the prize. But Jesus' first invitation is to rest in him because he's done the work. He's defeated the enemy. The scope of brokenness and the curse, the scope of, of, of the, the things that we see here in our city are not beyond the scope of God's redemptive work through Christ Jesus. And so Jesus dies, raises again. Jesus invites us to rest in him. And then Jesus gives us a community and a Holy Spirit so that we are not alone. 
you need the Holy Spirit. But Jesus has not just given you the Holy Spirit. Jesus has given us one another. We need one another. We labor together. And as we see these things, and we look at the work that God has called us to, Vintage Church, Durham. When you look at what God has called us to, to be a people together who love one another, who bear one another's burdens, who encourage one another to rest in Jesus, who encourage and spur one another to good works, who see our city and who see people who are like sheep without a shepherd, as Jesus says. We see the brokenness of injustice. We see the need for restoration. We see the scope of redemption that God is doing. We look at it and we can say, even in our cities, it is too much, but the scope of the brokenness of our city and our community, it pales in comparison to the scope of God's redemptive work. And what Jesus invites us to is to rest in that fact and then to get to work with him. Work out of rest, investment out of what Jesus has given. He's the first fruits of resurrection. We are raised to life with him. Therefore, we can do resurrection work because as Rachel Held Evans said over and over again, we are resurrection people. Resurrection people. People of the raised Christ. And so as a result, when we face opposition because Jesus died at the hands of his enemies and because our life is hidden with Christ in God, we no longer, we don't have to fight and oppose. In fact, our entire walk is as a people who love their enemies and in love turn their enemies to friends and to family members and to adopted children of God by the love that we, that we have for them and by the work of the Spirit through us. Our first posture, even when we face real, true, violent opposition, our first posture is not, I'm going to punch them first. Our first posture is not, let's get in and legislate them to be who we need them to be. Our first posture is love. And here's what's amazing, is there aren't enough workers, but if we loved our enemies in the harvest, there are workers. In God's redemption of people, there are more people who catch on to the vision of what Jesus is doing in the world and who walk and who work and who labor together. We know this. You make, you make more friends by, by building bridges, by loving enemies. This is who we're called to be. We're called, we can leverage everything because we know the gospel that our life is hidden with Christ and God. When we face that exhaustion, we don't have to push through to prove anything to anybody. We can rest because the battle's not ours. And even though we labor, it's God who builds the house. And his work is secure and done. Some of you right now need to rest. And Jesus invites you to that. He invites you to rest. Because we're here and he's done it. But not only that, he invites all of us to then, out of that rest, out of that faith, to do the work the good work of the ministry so that people would see our good deeds, see our good works, and glorify our Father in heaven. We're asking you, what is it that God is calling you to leverage? What are the first fruits, as it were, of your life that God is inviting you to give to the work that he is doing? among us and through us in our city and in the world. This is the call that every Christian has. If you're a follower of Jesus, the invitation is to rest in Jesus and in that rest to see what Jesus has called you to do, who Jesus has called you to be. And we're also inviting you as a church to join us now and over the next 20 years and beyond as we 
do justice through establishing nonprofits, as we proclaim the gospel through, uh, as a people, loving and seeing people who were far from Jesus become family to Jesus, see them baptized and entered into this covenant community. We're inviting you to join us as we, we continue to make disciples through planting churches and strengthening the churches that we have planted like ours. We're inviting you. We're inviting you to see your own discipleship grow as you learn to follow Jesus. As you look ahead to one who's in front of you and who's leading you along the journey and as you look beside or behind to someone who's, who's just, who needs you to come and guide them in the way of Jesus. This is our life. This is our mission. And here's the thing. Even when life kicks us in the face, even when you get that first hint or that 50th or that maybe it feels like 50 million, maybe you're like, I don't know. It's just like bop, 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 bop. Like, you know, like wherever it is, there's strength and hope and endurance to move forward in what God is doing in you and us in his work. Let's pray. Father, when the, the people saw what was needed, they responded. They came and they served, they gave, they shared. They loved and they hoped. May the same be said of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Each week we hear the good news that Jesus has done it. And each week we respond to that good news through giving and generosity through the table and communion, like it all comes to the table. Jesus is leading us all to the table, which we'll do in a, a bit. And through worship. So if you would, let's, let's stand and let's, let's sing to the God who's making all things new and who's using us to do it. Like, this is amazing. Uh, let's sing to that God.
As children of God, we have a seat at the table. What an amazing truth that is. And even more amazing so is that the table is not, uh, it's an ever-expanding table. There's room for all at the table of God. Because on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread with his friends and he broke it. And as he did, he said, this is my body broken for you. And in the same way he took the cup and as he poured it and gave thanks, he said, this is my blood shed for the remission of sin, the blood of a new covenant. And each time we gather together, we eat and drink in remembrance of him. And so, friends, I invite you now to eat and drink, to peel back that first layer. The body of Christ was broken so that you might be made whole. Eat. Eat. And remember. When the blood of Christ was shed, your sins are forgiven. Drink and be thankful. And one of my favorite things about coming to the table, uh, and I I heard uh, an Anglican priest, uh, Thomas McKenzie, say it this way. the table, imagine the table spreading across all time and space. The same table that we eat at is the same table that our brothers and sisters persecuted in underground churches in China eat at. It's the same table that our brothers and sisters in sub-Saharan Africa, in Ethiopia, in North Africa, that they eat at. Our European brothers and sisters, our Latin American brothers and sisters, all around the world. We, we have this facade of a table, but we gather at the same table to eat the same bread and drink the same wine and serve the same Jesus. That is our reality now, even though we will see it in its fullness in, day, in, in, in the age to come. And, and that leads us, it should, into worship. Because that's the hope, that's the glory That's the assurance that is coming. So if you ate and drank at this table, sing to the Lord your God.
Before the benediction, just a couple of announcements, reminders. Uh, next Sunday, we'll have children's ministry. It's the first Sunday of the month. First and the third Sundays of the month, we have children's ministry. We would love to see that be the first, second, third, dare I say fourth and fifth Sundays of the month. In order to do that, uh, we, we need more people. Um, and so if you uh, are willing to, right, like we, we said, like if, if you enjoy it, if you are gifted in it. Now let's 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 go here. If you are willing to and and can pass a background check, we would love for you to serve in this capacity with us. Um, it's a way to serve your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Um, but that is next Sunday. Uh, also, again, just to remind you, Tuesday, advanced commitment night, seven o'clock. Union Station. You can sign up, <coughs> excuse me, at vintagenc.com backslash bound. Uh, child care is provided. It's going to be a time of remembrance and, and worship and celebration. And we'd love to see you there. Um, and so if you would, you, you are. So just remain standing for the benediction. Uh, <clears throat> People of God, let us live out the freedom Christ gives us by a sacrifice on the cross. May he empower us by his Holy Spirit to love our neighbor well and to proclaim his gospel message to the glory of his great name. And I invite you now to, to actually hold out your hands and receive this benediction. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom be glory forever and ever.